it yet, then you can do that after class. Okay, so I think we're rocking and rolling. I'm not on mute, I hope. I think. I know, I can't believe I forgot it's Halloween. Okay, so is, um, is, your, is your recording working now? Like, I remember yeah. how before it was muted, you said the whole time. Oh, yeah, I have fixed that, I think. <laughs> okay. It's been working. I think I only had two business math ones where it was muted. So ours, I think, have been good since I sorted out the kinks in the beginning. Okay. Pretty sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, they're up there. Okay. So, all right. So last day we did this um, kind of introduction to T scores, right? So we've been dealing with Z scores. Now we're moving into T's. We looked at the only difference between Z's and T's was that now we don't know the population standard deviation, right? Which is what we're gonna have in real life, right? In real life, we're gonna collect a sample. Hello. We're gonna collect a sample, right? And we're gonna calculate the mean and calculate the standard deviation. And those are the means and the standard deviations that we're gonna have, right? So for a little review, Right, we said that we're gonna use T equals X bar minus mu over S over root N. So T is similar to Z, but uses the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation, right, which is sigma. Right, so Z uses sigma, but if you think about it, if you're pretending to know sigma, then you have to know what the entire population looks like, right? Sigma is the population standard deviation. So in order to find that, we would have to have the whole population calculate the standard deviation of all of those, right? And then what's the point of trying to guess what the mean is? You could just calculate the mean, right? But <laughs> that's not what we have, right? We have a sample and that's our best guess at what the population might look like, right? And so from now on, we're gonna start with just sample information, and then we use that sample information to test theories or hypotheses. So that's where we're headed. Okay. So when we're using T's, right, we have to find our degrees of freedom to use the T table. Right? So T scores uh, require degrees of freedom. Right, and we said that the degrees of freedom is gonna be N minus one, and that's on your formula sheet. So we use the T table to find probabilities, right? The T table is the one that we've actually been using all along, table C. Now I'll start calling it the, the T table because that's what it actually is, right? We've just been looking at the Z star line, right? But now we're gonna start looking at all these other lines which behave the exact same way. We just need to find our degrees of freedom line and go to that one instead of the Z star line, which we have been doing. Right. So to find probabilities, for T scores, 
we use the t table which we've been calling table c i'll probably switch back to calling it just the t table since what i'm used to but um and we do the same thing that we were doing before right we take the absolute value of our calculated t in the middle. So in here, we're going to put our calculated t. is going to be between two values, right? So find the degrees of freedom line. For your sample size. And find the two values that capture your calculated T. Then find the two values that capture your calculated T. Once you have the two values that wrap around your calculated T, right? Uh, let's say we have 20 degrees of freedom and we have a t of uh, 1.894 for example right that would be between 1.725 and 2.086 then we can go down to the bottom and find values a range for our one-sided p just like we have been doing right. so then our one-sided p so the one-sided p is between two values. From bottom of table. So you basically already know how to use the t-table, right? The only thing that's really changed is that now we use our degrees of freedom to figure out which line we're on instead of just going to the Z star line, right? But once you have your degrees of freedom, you can't jump around on here. You have to stick to that line. Right. Cool. So, oops. change the color. So that's kind of where we got to last day. Right. So today, we're going to start getting into the realm of hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing is uh, the moneymaker of stats. Right. So whenever you want to prove something, uh, show that two things are different, uh, any sort of proof that you want, right? is gonna have to come from a hypothesis test, right? And that's why you're forced to take this course, even if it feels irrelevant to your degree, you have to take it. And that's why, because if you ever wanna prove anything, you have to do a hypothesis test, right? You have to collect a sample and analyze that sample to prove it or disprove your theory. Okay. So, we'll kind of, I think we started 5.1 last day, but um, 5.1, let's say, is on one sample mean. Sigma unknown. So this is the kind of the, the basic test that we can do, right, is if we've collected just one sample 
and we're interested in knowing something about the mean of the population that you took that sample from, right? So if we have one sample, and we want to know something about the population mean I guess I should say the mean of the population sorry the mean of the population we sampled from So if you just look ahead on your formula sheet, right, 5.2 is on matched pairs, right? So then we're dealing with two samples, right? But they're matched. And then we deal with just two sample means, right? Comparing two means from two different populations. So we'll start with one sample, move into other types. So this is our first kind of question type that we're going to be dealing with. Okay. But from now on for these hypothesis testing questions, there's going to be a, um, the same question layout, okay, which is going to be different from what we have been seeing, right? We've been looking at something follows a normal distribution with a mean of this and a standard deviation of this, right? Find the probability of this and that and whatever, right? So now, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit more as if we were actually working with a sample, right? So I'm going to start by giving you the sample information, right? So you collected a sample of 40 manatees and you found the mean to be this and the standard deviation to be that, right? And so you're pretending that you've collected the sample and found the sample information. Right? And then in the question, I'll ask you, um, is there evidence that the mean weight is more than this amount, right? So in the question, I'll give you some hypothesis to test, okay? So as far as the question layout for, question layout for hypothesis testing questions, We're going to start with, I give you the sample information. Right, so things like N, X bar, S. you collect a sample of this size and you found the mean to be this and the standard deviation to be that. Okay. And then I'll ask you, or I'll give you a hypothesis or a theory to test. Okay. So then I give you a hypothesis or theory to test. So something about mu in this case, right? For one sample mean, we're gonna be wanna, we wanna talk about and know about mu, the population mean that we took our sample from. So a little bit different, right? but we already know how to do all the hard stuff, finding the probabilities to prove or disprove these things. So as far as testing a hypothesis, we have two options, okay? So to test the hypothesis, we 
we have two options. The first one is, well, it's just through a, a traditional hypothesis test, and that's where we're going to start. So just through a hypothesis test, this is kind of the more traditional route. Okay. <clears throat> We'll start with that one just because it's more um, important. I think a lot of industry that's not completely stats related hasn't quite moved into using confidence intervals quite yet. Right? So if you go out into industry and, and you have to do a hypothesis test, you're going to have to do probably a traditional hypothesis test. Okay? Um, as far as us trendy folk in actual stats, uh, we're moving more towards just using confidence intervals, which we don't know what they are yet. You've seen them, you've calculated them, but you just didn't know it um, to test our theories. Confidence intervals. Trendy. So I'll show you both ways. And then on the final, it'll say something like um, test this using a hypothesis test or test this with a confidence interval. Yeah. Asking the final, the final exam date yet? No. And I know I gave a, hypoth a hypothesized one, a hypothetical one. It was? And when is it? <laughs> this is very important. <laughs> Everyone go look. I'll post it here. The 12th at 6? Six. Six. 6 to 9 is a time slot. Yeah, it's brutal. The 12th? At least it's early. Yeah. Final exam. Hey, Nick, what room is it in? Are you just looking at exam schedule? Yeah. yeah. So just, uh, so first you just go on to like the Okanagan account and then you search up exam schedule. B10? Wait, is it going to be the account? No, no. B10. Just the Okanagan Okanagan College website. B building. <laughs> okay. Uh, all things might change. So um, the only reason I say that is because that's when it was supposed to be, but we found errors with that schedule. So I'm a little skeptical that that is going to work. Um, but if it is, that is top notch. Nice and early in the exam schedule. Late at night, but early in the schedule. <laughs> Good. Thanks for that. I'll have to, I didn't get an email being like, hey, here's the final, final exam schedule. Hmm. They had released, I think, four copies, all wrong. <laughs> it was insane. It's never taken this long. All right. So, we're going to start with just hypothesis testing. So, I know it's complicated when I say, so we, we have a hypothesis to test, right? But I'm going to refer to them as just hypothesis testing or confidence intervals, right? So I'll show you how to test the hypothesis with a confidence interval, right? But in terms of um, hypothesis test, I guess we could also call call this also called significance testing 
or a significance test. But I'm so used to calling it a hypothesis test, and so I'll probably have to stick to that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to lay out the procedure, right? so kind of your roadmap for doing a hypothesis test, because there's going to be four steps involved. Right? These four steps don't change, right? So regardless of what type of test you're doing, the hypothesis test is always going to follow these four steps. So it's kind of like the sound of music. When you know the notes to sing, you can sing most anything. That's what makes me think of it. So we're going to start and just figure out the process for any hypothesis test. And then we're going to apply it to just one sample mean sigma unknown, and then apply it to uh, matched pairs, and then apply it to two sample means, et cetera. Okay. So, okay. Hypothesis testing. which I'll probably abbreviate HT, right? So if you see that, and then confidence interval CI, of course, confidential informant CI. So hypothesis testing, um, follows four steps. And they're going to be your first step is going to be to state your hypothesis okay, in terms of uh, mu in this case, right? Just because we have one sample mean that we want to know something about the population mean. The population mean is mu, right? So we're going to state our hypothesis in terms of mu. Okay. So we have to state our hypothesis in terms of mu. Okay. So what we do, let's pick a slightly different color, is that we have H sub zero. That's, we read this as H naught. Right, or H null or H sub zero. But I'll call it H naught. Okay. It's just a zero. Okay. So this is what we call our null hypothesis. Your H naught, if you have a look at your formula sheet, right, it says H naught is that mu equals some mu sub zero. So we want to test if mu equals some mu sub zero, depending on the question, right? So mu sub zero or mu naught is um, changes depending on the question. Notice that we have this equal sign in our null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis H not always has an equal sign. Okay. And then 
once we've set up our null hypothesis, right, so you take the number that I tell you, right, is there evidence that manatees weigh more than 200 pounds, right, then you want to compare your sample mean to that 200 pounds, so your null hypothesis is that mu is 200, right, and then you compare your sample mean to how far it is from the hypothesized mean, if it's too far away, right, then there evidence, then there's evidence that the mean isn't 200, it's something else, right? And so the not being 200 or being something else is reflected in your alternative hypothesis. Alternative hypothesis, which we write H sub A, or some fields use H sub one, I use capital A for alternative hypothesis. Some like one because it's h sub zero, h sub one, but it doesn't matter. So whatever you have up here in your null hypothesis has to get brought down into your alternative hypothesis. And same thing for mu naught. So once you've established your null hypothesis, right, you're just going to bring down your mu, oops, your mu and your mu naught, whatever that value is. And your default alternative hypothesis is that mu does not equal mu naught. So the default sign for HA is not equal to, right? So if you read the question and you're not sure what sign to use, right? Or if we're just testing, is there a difference, right? So if I said, um, test the hypothesis or is there evidence that manatees don't weigh 200 pounds? Right, weigh something else than 200 pounds. Right, then you would use the not equal to, right? Because then you don't care which direction you're going in. Usually we have a more specific question, right? Is there evidence that manatees weigh more than 200 pounds, right? Or is there evidence that manatees weigh less than 200 pounds, right? So then we've got a direction in mind Right, so for our alternative hypothesis, the sign in our alternative hypothesis can be not equal to which is just testing if there's a difference which if we put it into terms of the normal distribution wait how does that come in don't worry it does Right here, you've got your hypothesized mean, mu sub zero, right? If you just want to know if something's different from mu sub zero, right, then you don't care which direction it's going in, right? So now, for the first time, we're going to have a two-sided P. Because this is a two-sided test because I don't care which direction I'm going in. So, oh, find the two-sided P. Because this is what we call a two-sided test. Two-sided test 
when we've got the not equal to in our alternative hypothesis, we have a two-sided test. So the not equal to means testing the variable. That's right. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference between your sample mean and your hypothesized mean? Okay. Our other options, we can have less than as the sign in our alternative hypothesis. If you look on your formula sheet, right, I don't list all three options. You could have not equal to, less than, or greater than, right? I've just got the default on there that mu does not equal mu sub zero. So you just change it depending on the question if you have to. So testing if x bar is significantly less than mu sub zero. Maybe I should write something so big for the first one. Testing if, we'll change this. Testing if there is a difference, is a significant difference between x bar and mu sub zero. Sorry got more thorough as we went to go back. Okay. So then, right, in terms of our normal distribution, T follows a normal distribution we have our center is our hypothesized mean, which means our sample mean must be somewhere below, right? You can't use a value that's higher than your hypothesized mean to prove that it's less than it, right? It just doesn't happen, right? And so your X bar must be somewhere below your mu sub zero, right? We just wanna know if it's significantly less than mu sub zero. So here we've got a one-sided P. And this is called a one-sided test. They're also called two-tailed and one-tailed tests, but I think I, I use one-sided, two-sided pretty exclusively. So, but if you see one-tailed or two-tailed, it's just the same thing. Yeah. So, same idea for the greater than, right? For greater than, we're testing if x bar is significantly greater than mu sub zero. So a lot of thought goes into your null and alternative hypotheses. Usually what you want to prove is reflected in your alternative hypothesis. But we do all our testing for our hypothesis test, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Okay. So we do all our testing, assuming H naught is true. Right. One thing I want you to make a note of up here in your hypothesis. So these are 
statements. Your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis are statements. So that's why we follow them with just the colons, right? So my null hypothesis is that mu equals some number. Right? My alternative hypothesis is that mu doesn't equal that same number. Okay? So I don't want to see equal signs after your null hypothesis because it's just a statement. Sorry, what do you mean not after? Oh, so I don't want to see something like h not equals mu equals mu sub zero. Okay. It has to be. You mu equals mu. Yeah, so. Must be a colon. Just to indicate that it's a statement. All our testing, assuming H not is true. I'm sure it's riddled with those kinds of sleepy mistakes. Okay. So that's step one. Taking your the hypothesis that I give you, right, or the theory that I want you to test, and turning it into a null and alternative hypothesis. Step two is where we're going to do the test, do the do. So step two, I just call it do the test. The test in general is going to be the calculation that follows the null and alternative hypothesis in each of these little sections. All right, so for the first three, we're just going to calculate different forms of T. Right. So for one sample mean, sigma unknown, we calculate T equals X bar minus mu over S over root N. Because what does T tell us? T tells us how far X bar is from mu, right? T tells us how far X bar is from mu, right? And I think it should be mu sub zero, and it is on your formula sheet. How many s over root n's is x bar from the hypothesized mean mu sub zero? Mm -hmm. So that, that's good. Got that one in the bag. Right, we know how to calculate t's, and we also know what to do with them, right? And so up here, I said that, okay, depending on your alternative hypothesis, right? You're either going to find a one-sided P, which we have been doing, right? Or if you have a two-sided test, you have to find the two-sided P, right? So what we're doing here is we're finding the P value. So step three is find the P value. It's the one, if you're in 5.1, got it? Yeah. So it's always gonna be the calculation that follows the null and alternative hypothesis on your formula sheet. So finding the p-value, okay, we just, we use the t-table with our degrees of freedom and we take our calculated T, sound familiar, and find our one or our two-sided P, and that's our p-value. Okay, so use the t-table, 
right, or table C with degrees of freedom equal to n minus one, Your degrees of freedom is going to change slightly depending on the type of question that we have, right? But for our first one, our degrees of freedom is n minus one. Okay. To find the values that capture your calculated t. from step two, <coughs> so the middle two steps we've been doing, right, one way or another with Zs or with Ts, right, we've been doing this all along, now it's more formal, right, so we take our calculated T, absolute value is between some values. And then we say, so our one or two sided P is between two values. This depends on your alternative hypothesis, right? Whether you want a one-sided T or one-sided P or a two-sided P. So there's gonna be values on either side here. Okay. So then, right, this is going to be your a range for your p value. So the range for your one or two sided is the range for your p value. So what is the p value? The p value by definition is the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme, right, pushing you into the tails, as what you saw, assuming that H naught is true, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So the definition of P value, it's the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme than what you saw assuming the null hypothesis is true. So if you have your null hypothesized mu there, and you find, for example, that your x bar is up here, the 
probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme is always going to be in the tail, right? So if you're on the lower end, it's in the lower tail, right? Because as extreme or more extreme, that's just the area in the tail, right? But we already know that our one-sided P on our table gives us the area in the tail, right? And the two-sided P just gives us the area in both the tails, right? Because it doesn't matter which direction we're going. Okay. So why do we do this? So the whole idea is that it, question? No, <laughs> just stretching. Yeah. It's allowed, but I'm on it. <laughs> so the whole idea with finding our p-values is that if our p-value is small enough, right? Our p-value remembers the area in the tail. So if this area is small enough, that means that our x bar that we saw is far away from our hypothesized mean, right? Meaning that, okay, if I've collected a, a reasonable sample and I've done everything that I can to get a good representation of a population, right, then I shouldn't be seeing a mean like this if the mean is actually down here, right? I always expect my my sample mean to be close to my population mean, which means, so many means, um, which means, right, my hypothesis is probably wrong, right? So if our p value is small enough, then we say that we have enough evidence to reject H naught in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay. So Let's write that down. If the p value is small enough, we say we have enough evidence. to reject H naught in favor of HA, your alternative hypothesis. Okay. So you do all your testing, right? <laughs> Assuming that the null hypothesis is true, right? But then if you end up finding that the probability of seeing this x bar, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, is really too small, right? Then we say, okay, well, my null hypothesis is probably wrong. I'll reject it in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay. This is a tricky concept and it's going to take some time, right? And an example will help, but we'll go through the steps completely first. Okay. So small, how small is small enough, right? So we need some sort of threshold that says anything smaller than this is too small, right? So I can reject the null hypothesis, right? So the threshold that we use is called the alpha level, okay? So the threshold, we use to determine if a p-value is small enough, nope, is called the alpha level. Alpha is just the Greek letter that looks like a fish. And unless I tell you what alpha level to use, you're going to use a default of 0 0.05. Okay. Unless an alpha level is given, 
we use a default of alpha equals 0 0.05. So what we're saying right, is that if the area in the tail here, if we have a one-sided test, right, we're just concerned with one of the tails, if that area is less than 0 0.05, we can reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay. So sometimes I'll give you, I'll say use an alpha level of 0.1 or 0 0.01 or those are really my only three go-tos, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. Don't really know anyone uses anything else. Okay. Then you can use a default of 0 0.05 if I don't give it to you. Yeah. Alpha level. It's a um, Greek letter alpha. It looks like a fish. I know. Tricky time to leave the room. <laughs> Come back. There's actual Greek letters up there. <laughs> okay. So there's been a reason why we've been trying to find the areas under the curves, especially focusing on the areas in the tails. Right? It's because a lot of our um, testing hinges on finding that area in the tail. Now we're ready to state our conclusion. Our conclusion is going to be three marks. And the reason for that is there's three parts that we need to cover in our conclusion. So step four is our conclusion. And it has three parts. Okay. The first thing you're going to do is in a statement, compare. So see how your p-value compares to your alpha level, right? Is your p-value less than or greater than the alpha level? Right? Those are your only two options. Okay. So compare your p-value. to the alpha level. Next thing you're going to do is if your p-value is less than your alpha level, right, then you have enough evidence to reject H naught. If, if the p-value is greater than the alpha level, then you don't have enough evidence to reject H naught. So we're always drawing our conclusion in terms of H naught because we did all our testing assuming H naught was true, right? So that's why we have to draw our conclusion in terms of H naught. So state conclusion in terms of H naught. And then finally, if you're rejecting or you're not rejecting the null hypothesis, right, we can translate that into answering the question, right? So the last part of our conclusion is to state the conclusion in terms of the question. And this is where I see people lose a lot of marks, right? Because each of these parts is one mark. And by the time you guys get through to the very end, you say, okay, I have enough evidence to reject H naught. You're exhausted. It's been a lot of work. And then you forget to actually answer the question, state the uh, conclusion in terms of the actual question, right? So you want to make sure that you wrap it up and state your conclusion in terms of the question as well. Right. That's why we set out to do all this testing in the beginning. Okay. 
So what I want to do is I want to show you there's really only two options for how you can word these two. Okay. So uh, generic versions. Oops. Right, because your p value is either less than the alpha level or it's not less than the alpha level. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> Rushing ahead. <laughs> so the generic versions that I want you to use for these first two parts, right? The first one is if the p value is less than alpha level, then you're going to say since our one or two sided, right? p-value, depending on if you have a one-sided or two-sided p-value. I'll underline that to indicate that that can change. Since our one or two-sided p-value is between something and something, it is less than our alpha level of whatever, right? You should always say what you're using as your alpha level. Okay. <laughs> Which means we have enough evidence to reject H naught in favor of H A. So first part here, right, is the part where I'm comparing my P value to the alpha level, right? Is it less than or greater than? Right? In this case, it's gonna be less than which means we have enough evidence to reject H naught. If we're gonna reject H naught, we should probably say in favor of what? In favor of our alternative hypothesis. Okay. So for now, right, I know a lot of this isn't gonna make sense, right? It's probably not gonna make sense for another, hopefully just a week or so, okay? But that's okay. As long as you start and just use this language, right? And just copy it out exactly as it is, right? It'll start to kind of make sense eventually. Right? So that, that's how I like to do these things is I like to give you just set things to memorize or do whatever you gotta do to remember them. And then eventually they'll start to make sense. But at least you'll have it worded correctly. Okay. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, right, or it's not less than the alpha level, if the p-value is, I'll just say not less than the alpha level, we say the exact same thing with a little tweak, right? So since our one or two sided p value is between blank and blank, it is not 
less than our alpha level of whatever, which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Yeah, means we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. And then whether you've rejected H naught or you haven't rejected H naught, you're gonna state what that means in terms of the question, right? But there's no generic blurb for that. So these blurbs, yeah. Would you write this like verbatim on a test or? Uh, ideally. <clears throat> it covers all your bases, right? You're comparing your p-value to your alpha level and stating your conclusion in terms of H naught. Mm. Uh, basically, you just reword the question as an answer, right? So, um, therefore, there is evidence that manatees weigh more than 200 pounds, for example. But I think we're ready for an actual example, or at least to read one and set it up. That's a good start. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Do, 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 do. So here's kind of a typical question setup, right? I give you the data, but we don't actually need it. Okay. So the level of dissolved oxygen, abbreviated DO, in a stream or river is an important indicator of the water's ability to support aquatic life. Just giving some background on why we would even care about this data. So a researcher measures the DO level of 15 randomly chosen locations along a stream. Here are the results in milligrams per liter. Okay, so here's the results. We could just calculate the mean and the standard deviation of these, right, these data. But I just give you the mean and the standard deviation of this sample are the means 4.771 and the standard deviation is 0.9396. Then we get, so here, just like I said, right, I give you the sample information up here, right, and then I give you some hypothesis or a theory to test. So then I tell you that a dissolved oxygen level before, or below, before, uh, below five milligrams per liter okay, puts aquatic life at risk. So anything below five, is bad news bears. Write that down. No. <laughs> is there evidence that the aquatic life is at risk at the alpha equals 0.05 level? So I give you the alpha level, but it's also the default, so I wouldn't have to, but we're just starting, right? So here, a mean of 4.771 is less than five, right? We know it's less than five, we want to know is it significantly less than five, right? And so the value that we want to compare our sample mean to is this five here, right? Okay. So I'll just write a quick note. We know X bar equal to 4.771 is less than five, but we want to know if it's 
significantly less than five. That's not something you have to write, but I'm just kind of talking us through it. So if you see something like, is there evidence of something, right? That's where I give you your hypothesis that you're about to test, right? Is there evidence that the dissolved oxygen level is below five milligrams per liter? Okay. So here we go. It's from, uh, from here. Oh, so is it below five? So let's just list some information that we're given before we actually start working out this question, right? We're given that N is 15, right? 15 randomly chosen locations, or you could just count your sample size, but the sample size is 15. We're told X bar is 4.771. And S, our sample standard deviation, is 0.9396. So now, step one, we have to state our hypothesis. <clears throat> So what that's going to look like right, is we have H naught colon, right, it's a statement, is that mu equals five, right? We have to use five because we want to see if the uh, dissolved oxygen level is less than five, below five. Right. So then our alternative hypothesis we have to just drag the mu and the five down, right? We can't assume that it's five and then conclude that it's less than four or something like that, right? We have to conclude in terms of the same values. So then we can just jot down mu and five. We know those have to be there. The only difference is gonna be in our sign for the alternative hypothesis. We want to know if the mean is below five, right? So we use less than five, making this a one sided test. So the not equal to, I would use the not equal to if. The question said a dissolved oxygen level uh, different from five puts the species at risk. Exactly. Right. And so here, because I'm only concerned with the one side, right, if it's below five, I don't care if it's higher than five, that seems to be fine. Right. But anything below five, so we're only concerned with the one side. And so that's reflected in our alternative hypothesis. Highlight that there. So we've got a one-sided test. So even though we talked a lot about, right, because there's a lot of components that we had to develop in talking about setting up your null and alternative hypothesis, but that's all that I'm looking for right here. I'll break all my steps up into steps and call them what they are. You don't have to, as long as you follow them, right? You don't have to write step one is this, step two is this. I like to do it just because it breaks it up. <laughs> Let's get into step two. Do the test. This is where we calculate T equals X bar minus mu naught over S over root N. Okay. 
So remember, we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is that mu equals five, right? So we use mu equals five. So X bar was 4.771 minus five over S, which was 0.9396 over the square root of 15. So I get, I did the bottom first, 0 0.24, 260367, 4.771 minus 5, negative 0.229, divided by that guy. I get a T of negative 0.943926. Seven or to three decimal places, negative point nine four four to three decimal places. <clears throat> Just looking at this, do we think that we're going to reject the null hypothesis? Probably not. Right, because a t of negative 0.9, right, isn't that far from the hypothesized mean. So it's kind of hanging out in the realm of the hypothesized mean. Okay. So step three. Is find the p value. Using the t table, right? To use the t table, I have to find my degrees of freedom, right? So I just incorporate it into the blurb always. Okay. So using the table with degrees of freedom equal to n minus one, which is 15 minus one, which is 14. I just show my work in there, or shove it in there, I should say. So now I have 14 degrees of freedom. And so if you isolate your 14 degrees of freedom line, right, we find the absolute value of t equal to negative 0.944 is between two values, 0.868 and 1.076. So now we have to think back, okay, do I need a one-sided or a two-sided P? We needed a one-sided T or P, sorry, because we only care about one side. So our one-sided P is between 0 0.15, 0 0.20. So we'll do the conclusion next day. Right? You can give it a whirl on your own, but I've run out of time. So I'll see you guys, oh, I guess for the lab on Friday. Make sure you get your lab data sent to me, right, so I can make sure that you don't have any duplicates out there. All right, so once you've picked your data set, send me an email, let me know which one you're using, okay. then you're done. I did. Pretty sure. Check. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I posted it on Moodle. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. So I just asked where to start. Uh, did you get an email that I sent to you yesterday? Yesterday. Let's see. Um, let me just end this.